Before taking up my position at the University of Cambridge, I spent two years living in Japan. And one thing really impressed me. No matter how dense the crowds or how complicated the traffic, the pedestrians and motorists always seem to navigate through these situations efficiently and smoothly. This phenomenon is not only limited to Japan. We see examples of effective coordination in complex scenarios across the globe worldwide. However, there are numerous counterexamples, and smooth traffic and effective navigation cannot be taken for granted. Traffic jams and congestion are very common. For example, London is one of the world's most congested cities. More than 150 hours are spent in standstill traffic per driver per year. And overall across the UK, delays are increasing in over 70% of urban areas. So clearly, cities need to be more proactive about steps they're taking to alleviate traffic and congestion to improve our lives overall. At my lab, we study interactions amongst autonomous agents. And my goal is to find out what kinds of interactions lead to cooperation across large scales. And so as I took up my position at the University of Cambridge, it was only natural for me to think about how I might create effective traffic patterns that are more efficient and how I might leverage cooperation towards this end. And so I decided to build an experiment that would illuminate the differences between different driving paradigms. And so I sat together my, with my students and we decided to build a model of a miniature highway. And we started by building what we call the Cambridge mini car. So this is a, essentially an off the shelf toy, which we retrofitted to make it a robot that we could use in our research. The Cambridge mini car boasts onboard computational as well as communication capabilities that allow it to drive autonomously in our experiments. And so we designed two experiments. We began with the first, an experiment of non-cooperative, egocentric driving. This is much like what you'd encounter on the roads today. And we were interested to see what would happen when we would create a bottleneck on our miniature highway. And as you can see, as expected, there is a buildup of traffic on the inner lane, creating congestion. And clearly, this is non-desirable. So we thought about, well, how can we optimize the interaction between our agents to improve over this behavior? And so we decided we would let the agents talk to each other by sharing their incentives and intentions so that they could adjust their speeds as a function of what they learned that their neighboring vehicles would do. And so we performed a second experiment with this cooperative driving style to see what would happen. And what you can see happening here in the same bottleneck scenario is that we no longer have a buildup of traffic on the inner lane because the cars on the inner lane are now able to negotiate a safe merge onto the outer lane. And what's so impressive here is that the change of behavior is so subtle, you can't even see it happening. But yet, the performance improvement for the system overall is significant. Here on this miniature highway alone, we have over 35% increase in throughput. So the insight here is that cooperation doesn't mean taking a huge hit on your own incentives, just a small adjustment with potentially major benefits for all. However, cooperation by itself is not enough. And as we said about trying to deploy these systems into the real world, we encounter a number of challenges. First, there's the challenge of partial observ observability where the agents can only really observe what's in their immediate neighborhood, and hence they take potentially myopic actions. Then we have heterogeneous or potentially even non-cooperative agents, where we can't necessarily assume we know what the agents around us are going to do and that they're gonna behave in some predictable way. Third, 
there is the computational challenge, where for an increasing number of agents and an increasing number of connections among agents, and for innumerable different possible traffic scenarios, it becomes increasingly hard to compute solutions in real time. And finally, there's the regulatory challenge, where we're simply just missing a consensus on what kinds of cooperative protocols we want to deploy on these AI-assisted vehicles. Instead, humans have focused on what changes we can make in the environment. And so intuitively, by structuring the space that our agents operate in, we can organize them in such a way that becomes conducive to cooperation. Here are a couple of examples where humans have designed very sophisticated environmental structures. We have multi-lane highways, we have intersections, and as we're in the UK, I'm sure you're very familiar with roundabouts. And then there are the designs that clearly don't work. This here is a famous example of such a failure. It's the magic roundabout in Herefordshire. It consists of several miniature, highway, miniature roundabouts contained within a larger roundabout. And as the story goes, when it opened in 1973, it created so much havoc and confusion that the drivers were driving on the wrong side of the road and the motorists were clueless and had to go to the policemen that were positioned around the structure to help out for guidance. We can do better. And because human designs are suboptimal in so many different ways, at my lab, we've been thinking about how we can leverage machine learning to generate better environmental designs. We do this by a procedure that we call co-design or co-optimization, whereby we start by optimizing the agent's behavior or their navigation policy, and then we improve the environments that they operate in, and we alternate between the two. So we start with reinforcement learning, improving the agent's navigation policies, where we enforce smooth and efficient and collision-free motion of the agents towards their goals. And then we subsequently improve the environments that they operate in through something called unsupervised learning, where we're maximizing the expected reward given that navigation policy. And so as we evolve through, the, through this optimization procedure, we eventually land at an optimal pair of agent behavior and environment design. So let's think about the design problem in the case of an automated robotic warehouse. So solving the problem of an automated warehouse includes solving the problem of robotic pathfinding, which consists of agents that have to find the quickest possible path from their start position to a goal position amongst hundreds of other agents that are doing the same thing at the same time. Now this problem is actually computationally very hard. So it takes a conventional optimal solver potentially several minutes to solve this even for a moderate number of agents. And it gets even harder as we increase the number of agents or we increase the amount of clutter in the warehouse. So let's start with the basics, an empty workspace. And here the agents are tasked to reach positions that are diagonally opposite to where, where they started from. And as you can see here, their path planning is less than ideal. It's not seamless. As they approach ongoing traffic, they seem confused and they don't really handle the deconflictions very well. So, Luckily, our algorithm finds a better solution, and it comes up with the idea of placing an optimally sized opt obstacle in the center of the workspace. And you can see how this obstacle now forces the agents to interact very smoothly and navigate very elegantly to their designated end positions. So the insight here is that actually obstacles can facilitate smooth motion. And we can think about optimizing performance in cluttered warehouses. So here, we've tasked our algorithm with optimizing the layout of a cluttered warehouse. And we were interested to see what it would come up with. And then you can see here that counterintuitively, it came up with the idea of producing an irregularly spaced shelving in this warehouse. And it turns out that this irregular layout helps 
in creating smooth and effective deconfliction and motion amongst the agents in the warehouse. And the performance is clearly better as the agents reach their destinations quicker than they do in the non-optimized, regular, spaced out environment. And the same kind of insight holds for systems at much greater scale. So here you can see a much larger warehouse, larger number of agents with more shelving. And again, we have our agents in the irregularly spaced layout, coordinating their motion more effectively and smoothly and arriving at their goals more effectively and quickly. And finally, we can look at a pick and place task where we're asking our agents to pick up a packet and deliver it to a goal location. And so here our algorithm came up with the idea of spacing out the shelves in a circular structure, since that seemed to coordinate their motion more effectively than the standard, more intuitive, regularly spaced out rectangular layout. So perhaps we should be thinking about designing round warehouse instead of square ones. So the environment can provide structure for motion, but it can also provide us with visual structure that we can leverage for guidance. And I'm gonna demonstrate that with this little example here. So in this experiment, we have two robots that are tasked to drive next to each other in formation. However, they have to do this without ever seeing each other. And what they're going to do is they're going to use the information they see in the environment, and they're gonna share this with each other. And from that information, they're going to infer how they're positioned with respect to each other. And so we compute a machine learning model that allows them to infer these visual correspondences. And as you can see here now, without the robots actually ever seeing each other, they're effectively able to cooperate in a collective task. So we can take this kind of algorithm out of the lab and have the robots move in formation, effectively cooperating in, an, in arbitrary indoor environments. And what's really nice about the setup is that these robots are extremely simple from a sensing perspective. They're only carrying a forwards-facing monocular camera. But let's take a step back and think about, well, what would a robot's dream world look like? And so far, I've been only talking about passive environments. So the typical way how we tackle autonomy is by endowing our robots with lots of sophisticated sensing and computational capabilities. Because after all, they have to handle a lot of corner cases that might be hard, and we need to be able to guarantee that they are continuously safe and reliable. And we end up often having to over-provision our robots with lots of sensing and compute. I think we're setting ourselves up with a really hard task. So why don't we somehow enable our robots to see around the corner? Well, we can think about doing this by simply offloading some of the sensing capabilities into the environment. And by doing this, we're enabling the robots to see around corners, to predict oncoming traffic. And we do all of this by actually sharing the cost of the sensors because they're now part of the environment. So let's think about how we actually go about distributing the intelligence. So we designed a system where we have a robot that has to navigate to a target location that is initially out of sight. And we have a visual sensor network that is placed in this environment that can compute visual embeddings and communicate this to the robot and help it navigate to its target on the quickest possible path. And so what's really nice about this setup There we go. What's really nice about this setup is that we can move the obstacles and sensors around freely and dynamically because the sensors themselves are both positioning free and calibration free because they're computing these visual encodings in real time and they're communicating this information to the robot every time they compute it. So the system is really fully distributed, easy to set up and has a completely plug and play nature. And so the vision here is, well, why don't we think about having a completely blind robot just leveraging an active environment to be able to complete its tasks? I find this vision really powerful. 
So with my talk today, I hope I've shown you that we can create more effective robots by crafting environments that are more conducive to the tasks. Since after all, a world that is better for our robots is also a world that is better for us. Thank you.